buonasera Ian, benvenuti a tutti Ciao, i partecipanti a questo Zoom sul Barbaresco 2018, questo focus. Abbiamo qui con noi il presidente dell'Enoteca regionale del Barbaresco, il dottor Massimo Caniggia, che vi presenterà l'Enoteca e il suo ruolo. Smascheriamo. Buongiorno a tutti. Siamo nella sede dell'Enoteca che intravedete. L'Enoteca regionale del Barbaresco è stata una delle prime enoteche regionali sorte nell'86 nel nostro caso e ha come tradizione ovviamente la promozione del vino barbaresco del territorio legato ai quattro comuni in cui si produce questo vitigno che è nebbiole che diventa barbaresco per le caratteristiche di queste zone eh, e per l'aspetto più commerciale legato alla degustazione e vendita dei prodotti. Aspetta eh. che magari faccio una traduzione perché sennò finisce che non ci seguono. So this is the president of the Enoteca regionale del Barbaresco. Hello everybody, by the way, it's Ian, Ian the Gara. I think most of you know me. Uh, I'm very happy and honored to be here with you all today to talk about Barbaresco. Today we're going to talk about the 2018 vintage Barbarescos. We have uh, nine wines that we can talk about to illustrate the vintage and Barbaresco proper. Next Monday we'll be doing the same thing with the wines of 2017. We have even a few more wines to talk about then. So the president of the Enoteca Regionale del Barbaresco was telling us that this is one of the first uh, um, regional wine shops, shall we say, uh, sponsored by the local government that has as its main activity, the promotion and the diffusion of uh, the values and knowledge about Barbaresco made of course with a Nebbiolo grape. Prego. Eh, sono qui con alcuni consiglieri perché abbiamo appena finito una riunione operativa della nostra enoteca. Non rubo altro tempo a questa iniziativa perché il mio era semplicemente un saluto ma anche un invito perché eh, quella che viene inquadrato oggi è la sede provvisoria dell'enoteca perché si sono dovuti spostare dalla nostra sede storica che è qui a 100 metri ma l'invito è legato al fatto che nel nuovo anno verrà inaugurata la, nuova, la sede completamente ristrutturata e ammodernata, per cui invitiamo tutti a raggiungersi qui a Barbaresco, nella nostra sede, nuova e rinnovata, fresca di pittura e di arredi, oltre che di vino ovviamente cresciuto nel numero, che è un'altra notizia che hanno detto prima, che in questi anni sono cresciuti a oltre 100 i produttori partecipanti all'enoteca e continuano a crescere, quindi non do il numero attuale perché man mano sta crescendo di mese in mese, si potrebbe ormai dire. Detto e ciò, fammi, fammi, fammi tradurre un attimo. Uh, so basically, um, he's talking to you from a temporary site because the actual site of the enoteca regionale is undergoing restructuring and uh, they're painting it over, they're remodernizing it completely, but it will be ready uh, in, with the new year. And he therefore extends an invitation to all the wine lovers listening uh, and those who love Barbaresco to come visit um, because the, the new site will be, the new offices will be brighter, more spacious and uh, more welcoming. Prego. Detto ciò vi saluto e vi ringrazio e vi lascio all'inizio dell'iniziativa, ho già rubato troppo tempo, grazie. Mm -hmm. Ok, grazie. So, thanks everybody. Um, for all those listening, uh, today we're going to be talking with uh, nine different producers. Uh, they're going to tell us a little bit about their estates. They were chosen basically uh, in such a way that they could represent the different communes of Barbaresco. For those of you who, I think most of you who are listening know Barbaresco very well, but for the benefit of those who don't, Barbaresco is um, a commune that is world famous because of its wine uh, called Barbaresco, 100% Nebbiolo wine. In fact, 
The Barbaresco denomination extends over four communes, and they are Barbaresco, Treso, Neve, and San Rocco Senodelvio, which was long referred to as Alba, seeing as if it's, uh, uh, it's on the periphery hamlet, if you will, of Alba. But San Rocco Senodelvio, I think, is a more appropriate name, and I'll have a chance to tell you why later. Anyways, a World Heritage UNESCO site, like all the Langa and the Ruero, elected in 2014. Remarkably beautiful area. I think most of the people listening have probably been to Barbaresco. And uh, wonderful, wonderful panoramas, wonderful foods, and wonderful wines. Because in fact, this part of Piedmont is famous not just for its wines, but also for some fantastic foodstuffs. And I think most everybody listening knows about the white truffles of the area. But in fact, this part of Piedmont has actually a very long history uh, with many other foodstuffs. And I think a lot of you would be surprised uh, about what foodstuffs there are. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about them. So today, we're not just going to talk about wine. We're also going to talk about foodstuffs because a lot of the producers who make Barbaresco actually uh, produce other foodstuffs. For example, the hazelnuts of Piedmont um, some of you may not know that Piedmont probably makes, grows the best hazelnuts in the world, a very special type of hazelnut called uh, nocciola tonda gentile trilobata, the trilobed gentle hazelnut, uh, which is round and has uh, three lobes. It's very distinctive and has a very intense perfume and uh, it gives the best hazelnut products. But we'll talk about that later. Today we'll talk about a couple of foodstuffs and uh, then uh, next Monday, we'll talk about a few more because we only have so much time. Anyways, let's talk about Barbaresco, 100% Nebbiolo wine, one of the world's greatest wines. Um, you know very well that Nebbiolo has a magical perfume of sour red cherries, red roses. It is one of the most floral red wines in the world, and it combines vibrant acidity with uh, uh, fairly sturdy tannins. But the tannins, I think, are somewhat sometimes overthought because Barbaresco in fact is a very smooth wine even when young it's uh, it's uh, a wine that is fairly early to drink although it can age forever a good Barbaresco from a good vintage in a good cellar can easily last 40 50 60 years um, anybody who has the good fortune of finding a Barbaresco from 1947 for example or 1961 or 1967 or 1971 or 1978 82 85 88 89 90 uh, those are still fantastic wines today um, the uh, the key thing about Barbaresco people often think about it in terms of Barolo they're two very different wines even though Barolo and Barbaresco are really only about 20 minutes apart by car drive depending how you drive um, but um, it's not that one is better. They're different wines. It's not that one is the little brother. Um, they're just different, different wines, much like Margot and Poyac are not seen as the little or the, or the big brother, but different wines, much like Chambol Musigny is, is different from Gevray Chambertin. Not one better than the other, but they're different, different wines. Barbaresco is located closer to the Tanaro River which means that the area is slightly warmer, benefits from a milder climate, the grapes ripen sooner, the harvest occurs in Barbaresco almost always one to two weeks before it does in Barolo. The hills are gentler, they're less sloped and they're less high. So again, it tends to mean a slightly warmer mesoclimate in this area. The soils are mainly uh, blue marls, blue gray marls, rich in mang manganese and magnesium that were formed during the Tortonian stage of the, of the uh, Miocene epoch. And um, uh, there are parts of, uh, of the Barbaresco denomination that have Cerevalian soils. Uh, these are more compacted limestone and sand. Uh, while the Tortonian soils, the soils that were formed during the Tortonian stage give you earlier maturing Barbarescos um, that are softer and approachable already at five, six, seven years after the vintage. The Cerevalian ones tend to be harder and tougher when they're young, and they require 10 or 15 years to be truly approachable. But the fact is that the vast majority of the Barbaresco denomination is characterized by soils that were formed during the Tortonian stage, and therefore uh, soils that will give you earlier maturing wines. And this is why Barbaresco is the way it is. Again, not that one is better than the other, 
Barolo and Barbaresco are two fantastic wines, two of the world's best red wines, and they're very different. I personally absolutely love a good Barbaresco uh, because it has an amazing silkiness. It has real power, but it really is much, much easier to drink. Before we move on to the, to the first, uh, to the first uh, winery with us today, I'm going to tell you just a little bit about the 2018 vintage. The 2018 vintage, I think, is a very good vintage. Uh, I think the wines are really approachable and great to drink right off the bat. Uh, um, it was a very difficult vintage, in fact, because it started out rainy and cold, um, especially the uh, May in 2018 was very, very rainy. Uh, but the vintage, even though it started under less than auspicious circumstances, really turned around thanks to a very good July, July and August that were warm and dry. And this really uh, made a huge, huge difference. Um, the only, it, it's generally, you could consider it a, a classic vintage, cool and fresh. The wines are uh, classic in the way they, they in their aromas and their flavors and their texture. Uh, they are fairly approachable, like I said. They're not the biggest Barbarescos you will ever drink. They're not necessarily blockbusters. Most producers, in fact, probably won't be making reserves from the 18 vintage, but the wines really are, uh, uh, especially, especially the best, are very well balanced and very, very uh, both easy to drink with some staying power. I think it's a very good vintage. It's a classic vintage, very different from 2017, which is what, which is what we're going to talk about next week. But I think 2018 is a, is a really good, good vintage for Barbaresco, and it's something that um, Barbaresco does extremely well in, in difficult vintages like 2011, which was very hot, or 2014, that was very rainy and cold. Barbaresco does remarkably well and often better than Barolo. In fact, both 2011 and 2014 were probably better in Barbaresco than they were in Barolo. So 2018, lovely vintage, great wines to drink now, but that can age somewhat. And I think... Um, and I think uh, the producers will tell us more or less the same thing. Okay, we were gonna go in alphabetical order, but because Andrea Sottimano has to leave and gotta go pick up the kids, these, these things happen. We're gonna start with Andrea, uh, one of the greatest states of Barbaresco, not because Andrea is here, not because I like him, not because he's my cousin, <laughs> but in fact, because Sottimano really is a great, great estate. I had the pleasure many, many years of visiting this estate and, and being with his father, Reno, a very a person I have a lovely memory of. And uh, Andrea has done a fantastic job. Uh, and the estate is really now in the, not just uh, among the best estates of Barbaresco, but really one of the best estates in Italy. It's also an estate that for all the terroir lovers is very important because they own vineyards and some of the most important crews um, of the Barbaresco denomination and their wines speak very clearly of those different crews. So when you get Sottimano wines uh, from the same vintage, you can compare and you can really see the different expression of the Nebbiolo grape in the different crews. Anyways, Andrea, tell us a little bit about your estate and your wines. Okay, thank you, Ian. Thank you for the introduction. I mean, thank you for the great word. I, I hope we deserve it. Um, <laughs> sure you do. I mean, we are... Uh, Payore. <laughs> the Payore by Sotivano, that's what the label looks like. Um, we are a family state. Uh, it's, and family means we are really a family. It's uh, my father, the two sisters, me, and uh, we do basically everything in this state. So there is not really someone that has a particular job or mansion. We prefer to, um, to not divide uh, our job and to do everything all together. Our state is uh, 20, a little more than 20 hectares. It was founded in uh, uh, 1769 by our father. And then slowly we arrived now at uh, 20 hectares. But my father started from zero, buying the grapes and then buying some, uh, some vineyards. <clears throat> From the very beginning, our father was very uh, interested and then was one of the first amongst the other to focus on the 
a natural approach to the vineyards. That was very, very important because uh, uh, speaking about terroir and Ian, you said very well, our state uh, from the very beginning always pointed on the difference amongst terroir. Now we have five Barbarescos, five different crews Barbaresco. And I, you know, yeah, I begin, I continue to say crew. MGA is the right word I know, but crew, it makes more sense. And, uh, uh, and then we produce a reserve. The only way for, uh, for an estate to, to let the crew express themselves uh, is always the approach in the vineyards. So it should be the, the more not inventionist, uh, the more natural possible. That's why we are organic from a very long time. And uh, this is the only way for the, for the soil to let express uh, in the glass. Uh, as I told you, we have uh, five different crews. The only difference between one crew and the other in the bottle is just the soil. That's it, because the vinification, it's, uh, well, talking about this, the, 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 the agronomic part, uh, it's uh, organic. We are beginning to use, uh, three years from now, not just uh, uh, organic products, but also natural products that have, can, have, can, so in this way, we can reduce the amount of copper. L little by little, our deal is to uh, reduce uh, the, the copper. And so that's why we use natural products like uh, seaweed, bee wax, uh, essential oil of orange. In fact, in fact, at Sotimano, they, uh, they have cover crops in between the rows. They mow the cover crops two to three times a year. They also till the soil in every other row come autumn time. And so uh, very, very um, organic approach to viticulture. But I go. Yeah. Um, and that's continue in the cellar because in the cellar we use only natural uh, yeast. That means spontaneous yeast, the yeast that's uh, natural. But that's a consequence of what we do in the vineyards. Only having this approach in the vineyards can allow us to have a, a natural yeast. And uh, long maturation, all the Barbaresco, they spent about 40 days on the skin, between 30 and 40 days. In, in 18, we did the 30 days on the skin, followed by two months in submerged cap. And submerged cap is something that is really important for the Romans. You said uh, well about 2018, because 2018 actually is one of my uh, favorite vintage in last year, because it's um, probably one of the most elegant, refined, pure vintage. Uh, of course, it doesn't have the, the character of uh, 2016 or 2020. It doesn't have the, the power of other vintages. But in 2018, there is a finesse that is almost Burgundian. And, and it's almost, there are some nebulos in 2018 that really taste like uh, uh, Pinot Noir. But the other good thing about 18 is that terroir, it's absolutely evident. Every 2018 I've tried, and I've tried many, many 2018 around, the terroir, it's really, really there. It's uh, fantastic. The, the, normally the body is midweight. It, it's not a, in 2018, you will never find a ultra rich or, or super uh, hard bodied uh, wine. But in 2018, you will find always wine that have a medium body, but at the same time, they have fantastic acidity, finesse, freshness. Uh, Cota, for example, the one we, we are uh, trying tonight, is, is, um, is a region exactly in between Neve and Barbaresco. It's at the border between Neve and Barbaresco. And you show Paiore, eh? Paiore. Sorry, to... Paiore, but let's talk about Cota. And <laughs> then we we'll move to Paiore. So Cota, it's a very powerful, very intense, very generous wine. And it's exactly at the border between. That's our historical crew just around the state. Paiore, the wine we are trying tonight is uh, very different. Paiore is in the town of Traiso. It's quite higher because our state is uh, 250 meters. The, the Paiore is uh, 330 meters on the sea. It's limestone, sandy. So the wines tend to be much more mineral, much more elegant. The nose of the Paiore, uh, it's always very unique because it's a unique uh, uh, sense of uh, spicy, sweet spicy, uh, white flower. Uh, the wine is never a rich or a bold wine. It's always a, a wine that is very straight, uh, is very elegant with a good acidity. Tannins are always very soft from the beginning. And that's the position. This uh, part of Trezo always produce wine that are extremely elegant, extremely mineral in effect. So for people, who, uh, for people who are listening and maybe aren't as aware, 
uh, Sotimano is an estate located in the township of Neve, one of those yeah. four townships I mentioned earlier. And most of the vineyards are in Neve, like Curra, like Cotta, uh, Fausoni, and Bazarin. But the Paiore yeah. vineyard that we're talking about now is actually located in Trezo. As a general rule, uh, the Neve Barbarescos are, are powerful Barbarescos. They're rich, they are uh, fragrant. Uh, well, the Trezo Barbarescos uh, can be divided in two types. The Barbarescos that are closer, uh, the, 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 the Trezo Barbarescos that are in fact closer to Barbaresco resemble the wines of Barbaresco and are fleshier and rounder. Um, while the Barbarescos from the part of Trezo that's higher up as much as even as 500 meters above sea level, those are extremely steely wine. They're probably the highest acid-driven and steeliest yeah. of all Nebbiolo wines, and that includes Barolo. So very different wines. Paiore falls somewhere in the middle because it's a bit closer to Barbaresco, but it has the elegance of the upper part. Paiore, Andrea's too modest, he can't say it, but Paiore really, uh, and I, I don't mean to, 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 to offend anybody else, but really historically, one of the, probably the five greatest vineyards of Barbaresco and really one of the greatest Nebbiolo vineyards of all. It really is a remarkably important um, crew. And it's also where Sottimano is some of his oldest vineyards, 50 years and plus, right? Yeah. And uh, this is the wine that we use uh, in uh, the best vintages to, to produce our reserve. Because mm -hmm. here we have the oldest uh, vineyards and uh, only the best vintage, like 2010, 2016, we make uh, a separate vinification for the small plot of older vines where we do the, our reserve. And uh, no, I, I totally agree with you, Ian. It's uh, Paiore, it's, uh, it's uh, historical. I mean, the wines from Giovannino Moresco makes the history of, sure. of our vinification. Yeah. And uh, they were in Paiore and that put Paiore on the map. Uh, yeah. way before uh, these wines were amazing and that's why also Gaia has a lot of vineyards there it's a beautiful vineyard it's not just a beautiful wines but also beautiful vineyards mm -hmm. when you are in oh. Payore it's really fantastic because you have a it's very steep uh, there is a, a great distance between uh, the vineyards and really the wines are really really very elegant in fact later uh, we will taste the wine from Piazzo and Piazzo's uh, classic Barbaresco is made partly with, with vines in Paiore. Anyways, grazie Andrea. I have the 18 here with me. It's a wine I love. It's, uh, uh, it's a wine I always loved. And it's exactly as Andrea was saying, it really is uh, Pinot Noir-like in this year. It's got the power of Paiore, but it has this amazing perfume and a really penetrating uh, beautiful sour cherry, acid-driven mouthfeel, really a remarkable wine. And this is actually one that I think will age very, very well. So a very beautiful wine, already very balanced, with underlying power. And uh, Paiore, being between 210 and 350 meters above sea level, has that extra elegance that uh, really comes yeah. to the fore when, uh, when, when everything allows. Grazie Andrea. Compliment. Grazie Ian. Thank you very much. Grazie Always a pleasure. Mille. And I hope to come see you in the summer if uh, if COVID ever yeah, allows. Me too. <laughs> I hope me to too. come visit because I, I miss you guys. <laughs> grazie. Yeah, ciao, ciao, ciao. Ciao, grazie. Right, so that ciao. was um, ciao, ciao, ciao. <laughs> so that was Andrea, ciao. and uh, I really recommend if you guys can get a hold of the 2018 Paiore, really a really good, really good, good Barbaresco and uh, a good example of what Trezo can do. Uh, next in line, if we have somebody from Bruno Rocca, I'm gonna go back in alph alphabetical order. Abbiamo qualcuno da Bruno Rocca? Ciao. Ciao Luisa, ciao, come va? Ciao, ciao. how are you? Ciao, I'm fine, everyone. how are you? This is Luisa yeah. Rocca, the face of Bruno Rocca. Exactly. Prego. Just because, I, just because I'm the pretty face of the winery. Otherwise, I would be in the vineyard growing grapes. No. <laughs> Luisa, Luisa, Luisa is again being modest, uh, not just a very uh, pretty lady, but a very intelligent and very capable one. I met Luisa, now I hate to say it, something like 20 years ago or something. She was very young and 
she, she but she was already back then i remember i came with a friend i don't know if you remember louise i came with uh with a lawyer who is a bit of a snob i like him i like him he's one of my best friends but he's a bit, bit of a snob and and very tough on people and he was so impressed with you he really really was so uh, <laughs> you had uh <laughs> You had you had you had the star look in you already when you started out. <laughs> the, 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 the thing is that we we me and my brother we started with a uh, gentle slavery since we were kids, so that's why probably I was already ready at that time. <laughs> a very talented yeah. family. Prego. So grazie, Ian. So our is a family estate. Bruno is my father, and along with my younger brother Francesco, they are the winemakers. So. We have a small property, everything it's uh, in 15 actors lo located between uh, Barbaresco and Naive. And our total production is around 70, 75,000 bottles. We have a huge focus on Nebbiolo production. So um, our family uh, grows mainly Nebbiolo and we make uh, <clears throat> like seven different labels of uh, Barbaresco and one Lange Nebbiolo. So we have a huge focus on these varietals. We love Nebbiolo. So our history uh, starts very long time ago. I mean, um, uh, we are recognized by the Barbaresco municipality at least from 1834 as a growers, as a farmers, but we never made wine. So it was my dad who in 1978 he started to, to, to try to be a winemaker. So um, he was uh, well trained about how to run a vineyard because he learned from my grandfather, my great-grandfather and the families, but he never learned how to transform a grape of wine, a, a grape into a bottle of wine. So um, he visited Burgundy many times to, to see, to try to, to catch what some secrets about, especially the fermentation process and, um, and the vinification. And in one of his um, business trips, business trip, it's a pleasure trip, he, uh, he met uh, at the tonnelier of Romane Conti and he came back on, with a tuberic on the back of his car. And in 1978, he started to try to make some wines, but we said that the first drinkable bottles were from 81, 82. So those are the first and last uh, two, three bottles uh, we got from the, from the beginning of my father. I am on the bottle of uh, Rabaya 82, because uh, when Bruno started, of course, he started with the, with the family vineyard. So my, my, gr my grandfather bought the Rabaya vineyard. So he started with the Rabaya and a little bit of dolcetto. So on the bottle uh, of Rabaya 1982, uh, it's uh, written 80, 815 bottles produced. So very, very small production. Mm -hmm. And um, since the beginning, we, we like to, to make wines that, are, uh, that, are, that has an identity. So for us, it's, we really care to express the varietals, uh, the terroir, and uh, the vintage, of course. That's why two of our labels are single vineyard, and from each single vineyard, we do a muscle selection, and we make a, a reserva wine. So we have a, our Barbaresco Cura, and our Barbaresco Reserva Cura coming from a parcel selection in the Cura. Same we do for the Rabaya. So we do Barbaresco Rabaya, and thanks to a muscle selection, we do our reserva from Rabaya vineyard. So um, the idea is to express and to represent Nebbiolo in all his um, different details and, um, and shades. So it's a family winery. So it's small, so we don't have any counseling, so we don't have any winemaker, as more of the colleagues are online now. Um, so everything is really homemade, homemade with the craftsman methods. So. Yeah. So it's, it, it is a family winery. I think just to help uh, place some context, Bruno Rocca is um, another one of the benchmark wineries of Barbaresco, one of the quality leaders in Italian wine. Uh, the history of the estate goes back very far because it dates back to 1834. And the estate has long been associated 
which is maybe the most famous Barbaresco crew, or if you will, MGA of all, which is the Rabaya Vineyard, which was bought, I think, by your grandfather, Francesco, back in 1958. And um, the interesting thing about, um, about Bruno Rocca as an estate is that Bruno, when he made wines, they were very luscious, chocolatey wines, very good, and they sort of made the fame of the estate. Now, with San Francisco making the wines, the wines have become somewhat more uh, refined, a little less um, showy. It's not that one was better and the other one is worse. They're just different wines. And very interestingly, this family-run estate in 2001 was able to buy, I think, four hectares in a fantastic vineyard of Neve called Curra. And from Curra, they make a regular Barbaresco, but they also make a Reserva, as they do from Arabea. And um, the one I have here is the Curra 2018. And I've drunk it now numerous times. I, I tasted it uh, from barrel with Francesco, and it was already a fantastic wine when I tasted it from barrel. And now from a bottle, it is just an amazing, amazing wine. 2018 Curra Reserva by uh, Bruno Rocca is a must buy for anybody who loves Nebbiolo. I don't know, Luisa, what you think, but I love the Curra Vineyard. And, and it's funny because I've always thought of you guys as Rabaya experts, but your Curra is just a fantastic wine. Yeah, so um, what we, what, what was the things that makes us fell in love with the Curra? it was his expression of elegance it's uh, always expressed his red notes so this uh, like um, um, also kind of uh, um, agrume like uh, orange uh, bloody orange and um, it has a lot of minerality as well and freshness and the texture of the tannins normally shows very silky very silky tannins um, which is exactly the opposite as Rabaya. So normally the Rabaya goes on black note, um, black shades, spiciness, pipe tobacco, and the tannins are normally more vibrant uh, or energic. Here in the Cura, we have all the finesse, uh, the elegance, uh, and um, the flowers and the red fruits. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have it here in, uh, in my glass. It's... Uh has, uh, I, I recognize Curra when I taste blind almost always because it has a, a steely backbone that is very unlike almost any other wine from, from Neve. If you think of, uh, of other, other uh, vineyards there, Cota, Serrabuela, there's a certain fleshiness to those wines, but Curra always has a really steely mineral spine that is really easy to recognize. And it's just a very beautiful wine, very much an iron fist and a velvet glove. And this is just a beautiful wine, fantastic wine. And you know, sometimes people will say the vintage is a smaller one, a less important one, but this is an example of why these generalizations don't hold water because the 2018 uh, Curra Reserva is just an amazing, amazing wine. Grazie Luisa, yeah. bene. Grazie brava. Ian, thank you everyone. No, brava te. Saluti mio papà e saluti sì. Francesco. E, e non vedo l'ora di vivere. Sì. Non vedo l'ora di vivere. Vieni a trovarci vivere. presto. Grazie, non vedo l'ora. Ciao. Can't, can't wait to come. Ciao, can't wait to come. Next, we're going to talk to Cascina delle Rose. We're going to go again in alphabetical order. From Cascina delle Rose, we actually have two wines. Two different crews or MGAs, the Tre Stelle and the Rio Sordo. This is another small family run estate, extremely high quality. I live in Shanghai, I think most of you know. And over here, the wines uh, do very well. I mean, I know the importer is already sold all out. Uh, I run a wine school here, among other things, and I wanted to put the wines in my wine courses, and I can't because uh, they're all gone. Anyways, Cascina le Rose, prego. <laughs> Buonasera Ian, grazie mille. Ciao caro, ciao bello. Hey, everyone. <laughs> yeah, well, we have a very limited amount of production, so maybe that's why also uh, not much is shipped to Shanghai, but uh, well, we work in total with about five hectares of vineyards, and uh, we work with uh, some of the most uh, typical uh, grapes of the Lange, so Dolcetto, Barbera, and of course Nebbiolo. In terms of Barbaresco, in total, it's about uh, 
more or less 10,000 barrel between Rio Sordo and Trastelle. So let's say 6,500 for Trastelle, about 3,500 for Rio Sordo, more or less. That's the production annual. And in total, yeah, and in total it's about 30,000 within the, all the labels. So Dolcetto, Nebbiore, Barbera and Barbarescos. The estate was purchased by my great grandma in 1948. So Rizzolio Beatrice, thanks for showing the labels. <laughs> uh, 1948 by Rizzolio Beatrice. Uh, they purchased the estate, uh, not with the idea of uh, producing and selling wines, but uh, producing wines to drink. They were great drinkers. <laughs> Their main business was uh, something else. They were doing, they were the mill owner of Alba. So producing farina, flour, and also in Nizza Monferrato. And so they purchase uh, Cascina della Rosa as a family countryside house where they can produce some wines for the family consumption. And for some of the meals, meals customers, meal, uh, uh, or for family friends. So the commercial history of Cascina della Rosa started only in 1992 with my mother, Giovanna, who basically founded the, uh, the business uh, in terms of wine selling. And uh, now it's run by my parents, my brother and I. So we are in four people. And uh, compared to Andrea and Luisa from Bruno Rocca, we are uh, slightly smaller. But we work uh, very close by because uh, it's like uh, moving from Curracota towards Trastel and Rio Sordo because actually we are uh, uh, confident uh, with Trastel, it's almost confident to Rabaya as an MGA. And Rio Sordo is right next by. And then on the other side, there's Pajore, so it's very close by. Uh, the winery is set on the hilltop of Rio Sordo, and uh, the main, uh, let's say, the, uh, most, of the, most of the vineyards right now uh, are in uh, Trastelle, where we also have Dolcetto and Barbera. So uh, in Rio Sordo, we only have Nebbiolo at the moment. We share a lot of things also with Andrea family and uh, Louise in terms of uh, approach, uh, I would say, especially in the vineyards. Uh, we are also certified organic and uh, we always practiced uh, even before the certification scale. Uh, in the cellar also, it's very important to be very uh, low interventionist. Uh, so in order to, uh, as they were saying before, the same express uh, territory, which is fundamental, it's not easy, of course, what is the most difficult, but for us, it's uh, is the most uh, is the most important. So to give uh, to uh, let the let the terroir be uh, you know shining in the glass. So when we talk about Trastelle, for example, what we are in love uh, with uh, with that specific MGA is the extreme elegance of it. It's always having a fantastic uh, silky tanning structure. Uh, when we talk about eighteen, of course, we are talking about a little bit a little bit more like a sweet sensation of uh, tannins. So that's also, I think, making the approachable structure of the, of the vintage. Uh, Rio Sordo, it, tendentially, it's always a bit uh, earthier, a bit, uh, uh, a bit more muscular, if we can say that, a bit more austere. Um, between the two, besides the territory, is the because uh, We are always close to 30. 25, 35 days. Rio Sordo goes a bit longer, so 30 to 40 days, and also with some submerged cap. So we don't do on Trastelle, Trastelle only pumping over. Uh, instead, on uh, Rio Sordo, we do also submerged cap for a little bit, so for a bit uh, longer extraction. Yeah, I think, um, you know, the Trastelle and the Rio Sordo MGA, very typical of the area. And um, Rio Sordo, really one of the famous crews of Barbaresco, and um, gives somewhat more approachable wines than, than some of the other crews of Barbaresco. If you think of Rabaya and the Zili, mm -hmm. um, the uh, Rio Sordo usually a little softer, a little mm, rounder already at, uh, at, at birth. However, it is a bigger wine um, than, than Trestelle. And you can really tell in these 2018s that Trestelle is fresh, it's lively, um, maybe not as concentrated as the Rio Sordo. Uh, the Rio Sordo has a bit more depth 
and will probably live longer. But two very, very good wines in the style of Cascina delle Rose, in the style of Cascina delle Rose, which is um, a very elegant and refined style. I love the wines of Cascina delle Rose. I really think it's one of the best producers in Barbaresco. The wines are very elegant and very refined. Grazie mille, Ian. Yeah. No, ma la verità, la verità, and uh, I've always, I've always liked your wines, and uh, there's a very light touch to them, even though there's there's real depth, but there's a a light touch, and I think that uh, if you drink them side by side, you can really tell the difference between Trestelle and Rio Sordo, and um, and I think uh, that's really what you want because Nebbiolo is a great translator of terroir. And uh, when you drink your two wines from the same vintage, side by side, it's apparent right away which is which and, uh, and, and what each one should be like. Quindi grazie, bravi, complimenti. Uh, two oh, very yeah. successful. No, two very successful 2018s. No question. Mm, very good. Fontana Bianca. If, uh, I don't know if we have somebody from Fontana Bianca. Abbiamo qualcuno a Fontana Bianca? Prego. No? So, uh, they weren't sure that a Fontana Bianca they were going to Scusa, be... Scusa, Ian. Able... Sì. Marisa. Eh no, non ce l'abbiamo, Fontana Bianca. Evidentemente non, non ce l'ha fatta. No, non c'è problema. So, we're going to talk about the Fontana Bianca mm, wines. This is what the label looks like. Um, the lighting here is what it is, but I've tried different ways of... Fontana uh, Bianca. Uh, different aspects, different Fontana Bianca started in 1969 with Franco Pola and uh, then his uh, family took over, Aldo, and they've been making wines now uh, from uh, a, different, a different number of crews. They make uh, two crews, Serra Buella, which is a very famous crew of Neve, and uh, from Bordini. Uh, but they make an entry-level Barbaresco or a classic Barbaresco, if you will, which is the label that I just showed you. And that comes from three different vineyards uh, in the Neve area. And the wine is uh, really, I think, a good example of what Neve Barbarescos can be uh, in the bigger, more austere style. This is certainly a wine that um, is a little reticent on the nose. Um, certainly, I, I decant uh, many hours ahead, and it's um, mm, it's just uh, austere, austere, and needs plenty of time to open. You can tell that there's a lot of underlying fruit, a lot of underlying ripe fruit, but um, it's certainly an austere and tough wine um, at this present stage. It just needs a little bit more time. The cellar it will develop slowly. Uh, if you think of Neve, you can think of uh, Barolo and think of Serralunga and Monforte. They are wines that really will require a bit more time. This one was aged in a mixture of uh, big barrels and barriques for uh, 12 to 15 months. Anyways, very pretty wine. Um, it just is reticent right now. It needs lots of time. In a good cellar, it'll develop splendidly again a very good example of how good the 2018 vintage is and maybe even a little underrated. Well, I'm gonna keep going then in, uh, in alphabetical order. We, we have a few more producers still, Francone, Montaribaldi, Paitin, Piazzo uh, to finish up. But we're gonna move on then by alphabetical order and go to Francone. I see that we have Fabrizio with us. Francone, very, special label also in the uh, also in the um, uh, Neve Township. And this is a beautiful wine. I got to tell you that uh, I'm really enjoying it. So <laughs> go for it, Fabrizio. Mi sto divertendo, è buono. 
go for it. <laughs> so nice to meet you, Ian. We are uh, so far, but uh, so close with uh, with Barbaresco. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> our family make makes wine since uh, five generation, and uh, uh, it was my um, great grandfather was a farmer. My grandfather owned a small restaurant and start to sell the wine uh, in this uh, kind of restaurant, Osteria. And it was my grandfather in the 50s to, to start to make only wine as job, to, lo to lose all other um, jobs and makes only wine. And my uh, grandfather was also a, a champagne addict uh, in the 60s, uh, makes a lot of... Uh, of uh, traveling champagne and, and start to make sparkling wines in the in the 60s and uh, about this uh, uh, also right now we make uh, sparkling wine and a few white wines but uh, the focus uh, for me and for my brother marco right now is the uh, is an abiolo grape and uh, we our uh, total production is uh, uh, of about 19 uh, Thousand bottles, ninety thousand bottles from about uh, twenty hectares, and um, we don't make uh, a basic Barbaresco entry level Barbaresco. We choose to to use a young vineyard or medium vintages for a Langene Biolo. We have uh, right now two crew of Barbaresco, Gallina and Fausoni. We have a uh, Reserva from the oldest part of uh, Fausoni crew is a vineyard planted in 1954. And we make our classical label Barbaresco i Patriarchi. That's a, a blend of uh, two different crew. One is uh, Curra and the other is uh, Fausoni. That's a Barbaresco uh, with, a, with a style of uh, uh, the year 50s and 60s, uh, blending two different uh, vineyards uh, together. To reach and the name of the wine, more... the name of the wine, the Patriarchi, means the patriarchs. It's in honor of some uh, ancestors. Exacto, exacto. We have we have this uh, wines, uh, then uh, Barbaresco, the Langene Biolo, and the Barbera d'Alba Superiore, i Patriarchi. Uh, in the past, uh, there were uh, one, uh, one picture of uh, each uh, patriarchy, grandfather, great-grandfather. But uh, we decided uh, uh, about 10 years ago to, to switch to this uh, uh, without the label of the, of the family, because in some, uh, some market, uh, people don't love to have the, the faces on the label. This mm -hmm. was a pity because... Uh, uh, we wish to, to let discover our family tradition, but we still make uh, the patriarchy wine in the grandfather style. So with a different vineyard together. It's actually a very good wine. I think uh, it's another example of a wine that requires a little bit of decanting. I opened this uh, about uh, an hour ago and at first it was a little closed, a little menthol, a little balsamic mm -hmm. note. But now, after about an hour and a half, it's really starting to open up and the red and the blue fruit are coming out. And now it's really a, a beautiful wine. Very nice, very weighty on the palate, very navy. Yeah. Uh, beautiful. Grazie. Thank you so much. No, so no, no. this style, uh, we are inspired from the classical Barbaresco. And so with a, a skin contact of uh, about uh, three weeks, not, so, not extremely long because we have a two, two vineyard with solid tannins and uh, with uh, re really rich tannins. And then we make the malolactic fermentation directly in oak. These are a barrel of uh, uh, 1,200 liters, uh, French oak, but uh, about 20, 20 years old, so they are uh, really quite uh, neutral, can give yeah. uh, a classical uh, approach to the wine. If I have to ask, for example, you make a wine from Fausoni, 
What yeah. is the characteristic of a good Fauzoni Barbaresco? I mean, um, just just so people understand, what is the characteristic? Fauzoni is a nave, so it's going to be a nave type of Barbaresco. But what is a good Fauzoni to you, for example? So Fauzoni is very close to Gallina crew, but uh, um, soil and exposure are uh, very different. So if in Gallina we have a full body wine, but very elegant. In Fausoni, we have wines more uh, powerful, but more dry tannins, good acidity, um, and uh, a little bit more color compared to Gallina, for example. So we have uh, wines more uh, powerful, more a little bit, not fleshy, but uh, where the, the red fruits and the acidity gives a uh, very interesting and uh, typical characteristic. Yeah, I think that's an important point for people to understand because, you know, a lot of the people who follow know very well the differences of, of, of uh, Burgundy vineyards. They know what a Charme Chambertin is gonna supposed to taste like as compared to a Mazie Chambertin, as compared to a Latriciere and a Griot. And what we need, for people to do is to become as comfortable with the many MGAs or crews of Barbaresco. So I think it's useful for people to hear about Fauzoni and Galina, which are two very important crews or MGAs of the Neve Township. Galina, fleshy wines in the style of Neve, but certainly very elegant, one of the more elegant wines. And, and Fauzoni instead a little bit more rigid, especially when young, and needs yeah. a little bit of time, but two very good vineyards and just two different expressions of Neve Barbaresco. Yeah. Yeah, I'm lucky as a winemaker to, to work with uh, so amazing uh, vineyard and, uh, and try to, to enhance the difference of uh, each uh, terroir. Fantastic. So, well, that's what you got to do because you're lucky, you know, if you work with Nebbiolo, Pinot Noir, Riesling, if you're that lucky, you might as well try to express terroir to its fullest. So congratulations, a Thank very you. good wine. I um, I really suggest to people if they can find the Francone 2018, uh, the Patriarch or I Patriarchi, uh, make sure you just uh, let it breathe for a good hour and a half. And then it's uh, really a remarkably good wine. And again, another example of how underrated I think 2018 is, you know, um, it's sort of unfortunate in wine when, when there's a lot of hype about a vintage, the ones in between or the ones just after get forgotten. And for the past five years, everybody's been talking about how good the 2016s and maybe the 2019s would be. And so everybody forgets about 17 and 18. And I think it's a shame because the 18s yeah. are really lovely, lovely wines. Bravo, grazie, davvero. Grazie We're gonna te. move on now to Monteribaldi. Abbiamo qualcuno in Monteribaldi? I'm going to just pour some Monteribaldi. That's um, the Monteribaldi. This is the Sori Monteribaldi wine. Uh, beautiful wine. Very, very 2018. Prego, arrivedo. Ciao. <laughs> Ciao, buongiorno. Ciao. So here from Monteribaldi, we are done. Cheers. 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 We're ready. <laughs> So my name is Georgia and uh, I am the sales director here at Montaribaldi and here with me is Luciano, he with uh, his brother, he's the grower, the producer and the winemaker. So uh, Luciano makes great wines but speaks very little English so that's why I'm gonna... I'm gonna present the winery a little bit by myself. C'è qualcosa che vorresti dire comunque? No, ho seguito molto bene come la degustazione, complimenti, bravi e siamo contenti di essere presenti in un'azienda. <laughs> Molto bene. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Monteribaldi, the story, the family. So um, the family is Italiano family, and the family was originally from Roero area. In uh, 1968, Luciano's mom and dad, they decided to move in Barbaresco. They bought the house and they started their own experience. Uh, both uh, Pino and Carla, so Luciano's parents, they were originally anyway from uh, winemakers, from growers family in the Roero area. But the family, as it's traditional for, for that time, they were pretty big. And from Pino's side, uh, they have uh, six 
brothers, actually seven brothers. So uh, that's why he decided to uh, that's why he decided to uh, to move in Barbaresco and to start the uh, the winery with uh, with his wife. So their their own adventure, let's say so. And that was in 1968. Uh, then in 1994, the two brothers, Luciano and Roberto, they took the winery over from their mom and dad, and they started their, uh, they, 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 they continued actually the, the experience. Now we totally have 30 hectares of vineyards, 25 of which are actually in, uh, in current production. And the total overall production that we have every year is of about 150,000 bottles, more or less. Um, and with those 150,000 bottles, we make something like 18 wines. That's quite a huge range. Of course, our focus is on everything which is Nebbiolo. So Lange Nebbiolo, we have three different Barbarescos, one Barolo, from a small vineyard in Barolo. And then we also have uh, everything which is traditional Piemonte. So uh, Dolcetto, three Barberas. Uh, one from uh, Asti and two from Alba. And then we also cover, of course, uh, Roero Arnaiz because of the origins of, of the family. Uh, I would say that what defines um, our philosophy at best is the concept of what we call and what we define vineyard wines. By saying and by defining our wines as vineyard wines, we want to stress the fact that we want to go a little bit beyond the concept of terroir wines, because of course our wines must be representative of the area they come from in terms of varietals, in terms of um, the composition of the soil, in terms of the microclimate, uh, in terms of the traditions and the know-how that we have in the area. But we want to go a little bit beyond that because inside the terroir, there is a huge complexity and we want that complexity to be represented by the wine in the glass. So that's the reason why we have a quite a huge range of wines. And this is also the reason why we work in each single vineyard with a specific approach, which is meant to enhance the feature of that specific position. So the idea is each single plot of land, of land we have is worked according with its specific features. And once we harvest the grapes and we bring those into the cellar, the idea is to um, basically follow the advices and the characteristic each single vineyard has. So at Montaribaldi, it's not the hand, is not the head of the producers and the growers uh, which rule, but it's actually the vineyards. So basically the vineyards, they say us, or basically we listen to the vineyards, we understand the feature each single vineyard has, and we work accordingly. This is also the reason why, for example, in terms of the oak, we use small oak, we use big oak. It depends on the feature on the vineyard. It depends on the tannins, on the structure of the wines we have. And then we decide to age the wines accordingly. So the vineyards rules, basically. <laughs> that's, the, uh, that's the idea that we have here in Montaribaldi. What are the characteristics of the Montaribaldi crew or the MGA? I mean, there is the Rabaya, there is Azili, there is San, <clears throat> there is Albezani. What about Montaribaldi? If somebody says, what's a good Montaribaldi Barbaresco supposed to taste like? Well, definitely when we are asked uh, this question, we always say that we have only one shot uh, to present us we open a bottle of Barbaresco Sori Montaribaldi because in the Montaribaldi crew, we definitely get one of the very best example of what a Barbaresco from Barbaresco should taste like. Basically with, Barbares with Montaribaldi crew, we definitely have an amazing combination between the power of Nebbiolo from the Lange area and specifically from Barbaresco, which is amazingly combined with an extreme elegance. So it's everything about this kind of balance. And specifically with Barbaresco Sori Montaribaldi, what makes it pretty special is the fact that uh, for this vineyard, the clone which is used to make it, it's called Miquet Rosé, which is a varietal which is not, which is actually a clone of Nebbiolo varietal, which is not so common in the region anymore. The fact is that um, the production yield that we get, they tend to be 
kind of definitely lower if compared with the average. And on the other hand, it tends to be pretty difficult in terms of color with the Miquet Rosé. On the other hand, if you want to get that amazing elegance that you have in Barbaresco, <clears throat> sorry, Montaribaldi, from Montaribaldi, that's the very best combination. And this is the reason why Luciano's father in 1968, when he bought the house and when he planted the uh, Sori Montaribaldi vineyard, he decided to plant specifically the Miquet Rosé. And he told, you know, uh, he told me, you know, at the time people thought I was crazy because I decided to plant Miquet Rosé instead of Lampia, for example. So, so he planted Miquet and Rosé. So it's actually Miquet Rosé. Hmm. Hmm. E vi mando, vi mando un'email così poi mi raccontate meglio perché sapete sto scrivendo un libro su Barbaresco è un capitolo lunghissimo sul nebbiolo rosé e quindi questo mi interessa. So that's really interesting. Um, and in fact, if you taste the Barbaresco Sori Monteribaldi, it really has a remarkable perfume and a very elegant mouthfeel. It really does remind you of a wine made with nebbiolo rosé and uh, very Pinot Noir-like, even more than the other ones that we've tasted so far. The other wines have quite a bit of barbaresco body, but this one's a very elegant, elegant wine. It's really Pinot Noir-like in the real sense of the world. Uh, it has, it still has Nebbiolo tannins. Yeah, yeah, I got it. In effect, he said very well. The Miquet Rosé reminds me, especially as this year, as was the year 2012, la 14 anche ricorda de, eh, molti sentori del pino nero ma anche mm -hmm. per la parete fogliare che ha queste foglie a confronto alle foglie del nebbiolo che sono più grandi queste sono molto prestagliate e molto più piccole per cui bisogna lavorare sulla parete fogliare su proprio perché poi c'è se c'è una parete fogliare che fa sì che la fotosintesi via dicendo è eh. per cui devi lavorare con molte foglie fare molta attenzione quando fa, vai a fare la portatura verde il mecatrosè da delle bellissime cose, ma devi fare attenzione in che modo la vuoi, deve essere ben, ben bilanciata. Questo è quello che conta su Michel Rosé. Sono contento che hai sentito che ricorda un, un pino nero. Questo è ah, tantissimo, nero. tantissimo. Senz'altro il vino oggi che ho assaggiato, che lo ricorda di più. I'm just saying that um, this particular uh, biotype of uh, Nebbiolo they have requires a lot of work in the vineyards. The, the leaves are smaller and um, it just... Uh, it requires a bit more viticultural work, but it gives you huge results in terms of elegance and perfume. And it does, it does remind you of Pinot Noir. Very beautiful wine, molto bello questo, veramente. A very nice wine. Quante bottiglie fate, Sori Monteribaldi? How many bottles do you make of this? It's about something between uh, 5,500 5, to 6,000 bottles every year. Okay. No more than that. Well, e, very good wine. E sul Maybe... Michetto Rosé, eh, diciamo, sono su, i Montaribaldi, bisogna assaggiare le annate vecchie che ti danno, ti spiazzano veramente, ti danno delle, veramente delle, delle cose particolari. Ma... Qual è la prima annata che avete fatto? When was the first 94. year of this wine you made? Eh? 94. Come, okay. In so, terms of with Montaribaldi, as mentioned, and as, let's say, MGA, officially in the label, it was 1994. But his father planted it in 1968, so then it's kind of sure. older than that. Sure. Well, you know, it's important because, you know, a lot of uh, people, maybe a lot of wine lovers know some of the uh, more famous or better known Barbaresco estates, and there's a lot of them. And instead, I think it's great because there are so many producers, well over 100, who are members of the Enoteca Regionale, close to 140, as a matter of fact. And there are many, many small estates, family-run estates in Barbaresco that really deserve to be better known. And I think this is an example of a very good wine that maybe a lot of wine lovers really haven't had a chance to taste yet or, or, or don't know. So congratulations, bravi, è veramente buono e molto elegante soprattutto, very elegant wine. Okay, so we're going to move on now to... Um, grazie mille. Grazie. Cheers. Grazie. Grazie davvero. We're going to go to Paitin, Luca, who 
who is in the Enoteca Regionale because he's also one of the councillors of the Enoteca Regionale and his estate is in Neve called Paitin and he's going to tell us a little bit about himself. Luca. Ciao Ian. Ciao. 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 So, um, my, my family lives, uh, lives in Neve, in Saravoella. And uh, before entering the um, word and the description of my family, I would be um, also happy to start with the fact that uh, uh, every producer that you interviewed is uh, speaking about the neutrality they are having uh, on uh, the way they work uh, in the vineyards, but uh, on, the, on the fact uh, of the impact of, uh, of their work. Uh, Andrea started with these, Luisa prosecuted with the same, and Ricardo so on. And uh, the other good thing is that uh, uh, the style that apparently everybody are speaking of uh, is a style of uh, being uh, uh, transparent towards the soil, so letting the soil express uh, express itself. And the fact that everybody, almost every producer, has touched this point for me is a sense of maturity that uh, Barbaresco is expressing, uh, both in terms of uh, understanding of uh, of the soil and the work we do in the vineyards, and the understanding of the potentiality of the greatness of of this variety. So, uh, and that's why probably we have also less to. Uh, speak about that because it's becoming more obvious when you're drinking uh, Barbaresco in general you know that you're drinking producer they are working for the more transparent expression possible of, uh, of their heel so we are resuming uh, the concept uh, that uh, um, me as a mix of, uh, of soil uh, of heritage of interpretation of uh, of, uh, of a vineyard itself of a microclimate and so this is uh, it's making our job even easier once everybody understood that the power of Barbaresco is this kind of uh, uh, expression and unique expression. Uh, my family, going back to my family, we are um, deeply entrenched with the crew Saraboella. Uh, and uh, we are also entrenched with the um, uh, beginning of the Barbaresco story because we were uh, we own the lands uh, since uh, centuries, uh, 1786. Uh, but in 1893, we um, decided to follow um, a very important leader of uh, enology of the area that was Domizio Cavazza. So in that period, uh, the grandfather or my grandfather started uh, working on, uh, on his Nebbiolo, trying to make uh, a protocol together with uh, Cavazza and in 1893 they in fact bottled our uh, our very first uh, Barbaresco and uh, after this period obviously uh, the winery got uh, a quite nice uh, success uh, with the first families working all together group together and Neve at the time was also fun because wanted to stay away from from the Barbaresco denomination with its own denomination and through years we were able to understand uh, what were the qualities uh, and the characteristics of this, uh, of this area. Mm, obviously, uh, the Second World War brought, uh, kind of uh, damaged a bit the, the um, winemaking of the family and everything was uh, again reordered by, by my grandpa. Uh, our um, vineyards and then our cellar is, is mainly in, uh, in Saraboella and uh, Saraboella sits on uh, the southern part uh, of the denomination under the, the commune of Neve and in my opinion is expressing some characteristics of Neve, uh, for example the weight, the volume uh, and uh, the character of the tannins that tends to be uh, more uh, grippy on the nave on the nave sides, but the same way uh, is distancing a bit uh, from uh, the more closer to the river MGAs or Cruz, because Raboella sits a little bit more on on higher slopes, a little bit more distant from uh, the Tanaro River in an open valley. And, uh, and this is able to warm a lot uh, the vineyards of Serabuela despite their altitude. And uh, uh, this altitude combined with this a little bit more continental climate we have respect to the um, crews sitting on the Tanaro River 
uh, we get a kind of a unique feeling of uh, minerality, verticality in the wines, of you, normally a very lively acidity. And uh, this creates kind of a unique um, expression uh, of uh, adding up to the various expression of, uh, of Neve. And uh, this uh, is, um, for us, it's great to work with these vineyards because uh, despite the characteristics they described, so the volume, the intensity, the, the complexity, the verticality that can make sometimes a wine a, a, wine a little bit more austere, um, this very, very steep and white soil gives an extreme finesse to the end of the wine. And uh, this kind of uh, connect together all the different points uh, and uh, craft the character of, of Saraboel itself. Yeah, no, I think uh, that's a good point because um, terroir is complicated by definition. And if you think of Burgundy, um, it's uh, tr tremendously complicated. Um, you you learn that maybe Chambol Musigny gives you more elegant wines and Gevray Chambertin gives you more powerful wines, but in fact, it's very, very complicated because within Gevray and within Chambol, you have many different vineyards and many different realities. And it's the same thing with Barbaresco. So we can generalize and say the wines of Neve are fleshier and bigger than the ones of let's say Trezo, uh, but in fact, within Neve, there are different sectors and you made that uh, very clear. So for example, uh, on the Eastern side where you have Serabuela, it is uh, a little fresher, a little cooler, uh, verticality and higher acidity. So the wines are fleshy in the Neve style, but very elegant. And then um, if you go towards Barbaresco, uh, or towards Trezo, the wines will change again. Um, as you move towards Trezo, the valleys become tighter, more windy, it's cooler, and the wines have uh, uh, even more uh, even more verticality. And uh, in different vineyards, you have different realities. In the Bazara, you have some sandy veins that maybe you don't have in Serabuella, and that means that the Barbarescos of Bazara are going to be very different from the wines of Serabuella. So uh, it's really, really interesting. And it just takes a little bit of time, a little bit of patience to get to know the wines of Barbaresco. But just like people know the wines of Bordeaux and people know the wines of Burgundy, they can and they should know the wines of Barbaresco because it just makes it more interesting and a lot more fun. Yeah, I think that this discussion we're having is for sure a, a good step in this direction. So for letting yeah, people more aware yeah, it's important because it creates value, it creates interest, and uh, and and it's very true because these wines are very different, even though they're made with an Abiolo grape, the same producer working the same way in the same vintage can make very different wines from vineyard to vineyard, and therein lies the magic of uh, of uh, of Barbaresco in general. Molto bene, Luca. Bravo, bravissimo. Grazie, complimenti. Grazie. Last but not least, last but not least, we're going to move on to our last uh, wine for today. And this is a winery uh, which is very different from the other ones because of the source of the vineyards. And this is the Piazzo Estate. Do we have anybody from Piazzo here or not? Maybe not because they said they were maybe not able to reach us and that's okay. So Armando Piazzo is an estate that um, I personally quite like because it is located in San Rocco Senodelvio. San Rocco Senodelvio is one of the uh, four communes of Barbaresco and it is the one that I, I said earlier gives the most approachable wines. For the longest time, San Rocco Senodelvio was uh, just called Alba because it sits on the outskirts of Alba. Alba is the big city, if you will, in the Barbaresco Barolo area, a little bit like Bone is. In, in Burgundy, but in fact, I don't think that it's a good idea, and I've, I've told the producers this many, many times, I don't think it's a good idea to call San Rocco San Delvio Alba, not because Alba, there's anything wrong with it, it's a very important city, it's a lovely city, but because San Rocco San Delvio actually has a lot to, to talk about, a lot to boast, and I've said this many times before, I've recently even done a video on Barbaresco, and I mentioned it, but the Elvio in San Rocco San Delvio refers to a Roman emperor who's actually born in this little city. His name was Elvio Publio Pertinace, and he was a Roman emperor. 
And this little town gave birth to a Roman emperor. So I think it behooves everybody there to want to broadcast the name of San Rocco Seno Delvio. Um, there's also a river there called the Seno Delvio, a stream actually, it's not really a river, a stream. Um, and so uh, the name actually has uh, many, many origins. San Rocco Seno Delvio gives you um, the earliest maturing of all Barbarescos. In fact, there is only one MGA that is completely within the San Rocco Seno Delvio township. The other MGAs or crews of San Rocco Seno Delvio are in fact shared with Trezo. Uh, so for example, Meruzzano or Montersino, these are uh, wonderful MGAs and crews, but they are shared in fact with Trezo. The one that is entirely belonging to San Rocco Seno Delvio is called Rocche Massalupo. And Rocche Massalupo is um, a crew, an MGA that's about 200 to 300 meters above sea level. It's characterized by essentially lighter soils, clay calcareous like they are in most of Barbaresco, but with a little bit of sand and the wines are certainly more delicate as, as the wines of San Rocco Seno Delvio tend to be. But with a Rocche Massalupo wine, we've had a chance to taste a few like I have, and there's a bunch of producers there who do make them. Um, you notice right away that the wine is just more de delicate. It has a different tannic architecture. It has a, um, a lighter, a lighter uh, framework, but really, really lovely wines. And I quite, quite love them. Um, the, um, the wine that we're drinking from Piazzo, if, if I ever find it, ah, here it is. This is the Piazzo Barbaresco, the Piazzo Barbaresco, a very recognizable label, uh, is really made with a blend of vineyards from uh, both um, Trezo and San Rocco Seno Delvio. In fact, um, the two vineyards that contribute to this wine are the Rocche Massalupo MGA or crew of um, San Rocco Seno Delvio and the very famous Paiore from Trezo. So this is a Barbaresco that's got a lot going for it and uh, has every reason to be a, a really cool wine. It's not aged a long time in oak, anywhere from nine to 12 months. And the reason for that is because uh, the San Rocco Seno Delvio grapes probably don't want a lot of oak there. Um, because they, then you run the risk of over-oaking the wine. But certainly, um, this is a beautiful wine by Piazzo. Uh, very drinkable, very easy to drink, but um, that will last 10, 12, 15 years without a problem. Uh, beautiful now, but that will age. Lots of sour red cherry, lots of uh, red roses, a little bit of licorice, which is pretty typical of the Paiore vineyard. Uh, and very silky, which is very typical of the Rocca Massalupo vineyard. So Piazzo, very good wines. I really think that the wines of San Rocco Seno Delvio deserve to be better known. There's many very good producers there. For example, uh, Marco and Vittorio Adriano is an estate that has long made uh, very good wines from San Rocco Seno Delvio. Uh, Lano is another one who makes a lovely Rocca Massalupo Barbaresco. So really, um, and there's more and more producers in the Barbaresco denomination who are buying vineyards in San Rocco Seno Delvio. You're probably going to see a lot more Rocche Massalupo wines in the future. So good. So that is our uh, talk on the uh, Barbarescos from 2018. And uh, again, an underrated vintage of Pinot Noir-like wines that are ready to drink sooner, but that will age nonetheless. Never the most structured wines but really beautiful, fresh, and very, very classic. Now, before I, uh, I, I, I wish you all goodbye and um, I go to sleep because here it's like 3.30 in the morning in Shanghai, um, I, do wanna, I do wanna tell you a little bit because we never get a chance to talk about this, but actually the Barbaresco, the Lange area in general is an area where you not only have great, great um, wines, but you've got some very great foods and you know about the truffles, but what I want to tell you a little bit about is, for example, you will not believe this, and this is something that I think uh, mm, needs up. This is, if you see it, it's honey. And believe it or not, Piedmont, well, you're not going to believe this, but Piedmont is Italy's biggest producer of honey. In fact, this is an acacia honey made by the very famous um, Odero estate. 
Odero is an estate in Lamora, but they also make a, a very good Barbaresco Galena. And uh, they've been making honey for a long, long time. Uh, this is an estate that traces its winemaking roots back to the 19th century. And um, they make a wonderful, wonderful acacia honey. Piedmont is the biggest producer of honey in Italy. The three regions that make the most honey in Italy are Piedmont, Lombardy, and Emilia-Romagna in that order. Uh, just think that Italy has about a million and a half beehives and over 200,000 are found in Piedmont. To give you an idea, there's over 200,000 in Piedmont, there's about 150,000 in Lombardy and about 120,000 in Emilia-Romagna. So honey production in Piedmont is very, very important. Everybody talks about truffles, everybody talks about the cheeses, and, and nobody ever really mentions the honey. This is an acacia honey. Acacia honey is probably the most elegant and refined of all honeys. It's made from the nectar of a plant called Rubinia pseudoacacia, which is what we usually call uh, the acacia tree in Europe. But in fact, that's wrong because it's not the acacia tree. It is the, it's the false acacia tree or the pseudo acacia tree also known as the black locust tree. In fact, in the United States of America, you sell acacia honey with that name, but you also sell it as locust honey. The interesting thing about acacia honey is that it has a much higher fructose content than other honeys. So it has more fructose than sucrose. And that has two, three very important things, uh, consequences. The first one is that because it has a higher fructose content, acacia honey does not crystallize like the other honey. So it stays liquid longer. Not only that, but because of its higher fructose contents, you can use it to sweeten things without altering the taste of what you're going to be eating all that much. So it's actually a very good honey to add to beverages because you're not going to change the taste of that beverage all that much. And last but not least, because it is higher in fructose than it is in sucrose, it's actually a very good honey for diabetics. So uh, I hope I've surprised you with this. Nobody really ever talks about the honey of Piedmont, but in fact, it is one of the uh, big, big uh, uh, industries of the region. And again, Italy's biggest producer of, um, of honey. There's another, there's another um, honey-like, actually jam-like substance. Mm, it's very famous in Piedmont, and that is the cugna. The cugna, or cogna, mm, 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 very good. It's basically a product that's been made for eons in Italy. Nobody knows exactly when it was first made. The cugna is basically a jam, really, made with the must. And it really was always made during harvest time because what the farmers would do at that age, you know, centuries ago, nobody would throw anything away. What they would do is they would get the excess grapes and the excess fruit that they would harvest at that time of the year and they would combine it to make a jam. So basically a cugna, the exact recipe or cugna is um, really not known because every little village, every family had its own recipe. Basically they were using the fruit they were growing. So of course it would vary the recipe from uh, not just town to town, but from family to family. The bottom line is it's basically uh, must, it's apples, uh, pears, the local very famous pears, Pera Madernassa, the very famous Madernassa pear, one of Italy's highest quality pears. Hazelnuts, of course, figs, oranges. But again, um, and what you do is you put all the fruit together with twice as much water and you would boil it until all that water uh, was reduced and, um, and you'd basically have something of a jammy-like consistency. Cugna has a dark blue color, um, purplish color. It is really fantastic with boiled meats, uh, cheeses, and even just lathered on bread. That's what I do, very much like a jam. It's a little bit more liquid, uh, but it's um, just a fantastic sauce to go with uh, aged cheeses, soft cheeses, and again, boiled meats. So anytime you come to, to Piedmont and you wanna try something, especially in the fall, try the cugna or cogna with, uh, with your boiled meats or cheeses. It really is a delicacy. And last but not least, the, uh, that cugna, by the way, was made by the Marco and Vittorio Adriano estate that I mentioned earlier, that is a really high, high quality Barbaresco estate in the town of San Rocco, San Odelvio. Uh, make a fantastic Barbaresco, by the way, called Sanadaive, 
that I really recommend. Uh, it's really worth worth knowing. And last but not least, mm, I'm going to tell you about another Piedmont product that's really cool. And that is the um, slightly reddish. You see it here. It's got sort of a red currenty look. Mm, mm, mm. That is a rose hip jam. Rose hips are very common in Italy. It's a thorny bush known as the wild rose or the dog rose. And um, we've been making um, um, jam from rose hips in Italy forever. And the Rivetto estate out in Serra Lunga d'Alba um, is, um, is an estate that um, uh, has been making uh, biodynamic uh, farming a way of life for the past uh, really 11 years. Um, they were uh, certified uh, just recently, but they began back in 2010. And um, the rose hip is, um, is uh, a thorny bush. It's about 200 centimeters high at most. And you take these pseudo fruits, these rose hips, and you just basically um, boil them until they're mushy. And uh, then you, you squish them. You have, to sieve, you have to strain them so you get rid of the pips. You use a sieve or a muslin bag to strain and you get this basically um, pale to medium red uh, jam that is extremely healthy because it is ridiculously high in uh, vitamin C, phenols, and other molecules that have very high antioxidant effects. So uh, rosehip jam, uh, one of the truly uh, healthy foods of Italy, I, um, I point out that there's different types of, of dog rose or wild roses. And um, very interestingly, the concentration, for example, of vitamin C of the different species will differ. For example, um, the, the species, the genus is called Rosa. Uh, there is one called Rosa rugosa. And uh, the one that we use in Italy to make rosa honey is called rosa canina. And for example, to give you an example, from rosa canina, it's about 600 milligrams of vitamin C per liter. In the rosa rugosa plant, there's about 1,200 milligrams of vitamin C per liter. Th those are huge amounts. That's way more than orange juice. And um, so these are really antioxidant bombs. And uh, the jam is not just tasty but it's actually a very healthy product and, and one that I uh, thoroughly enjoy, um, encourage you to try. Again, you know, in Piedmont, just like everywhere else in Italy, there are many, many foodstuffs the region is famous for, but there are some that sometimes are forgotten by the wayside, and yet they are part of the, of the territory. They're part of the territory, and one way to get to know the territory is not just through its wines, but also through its foodstuffs. So the next time you visit Piedmont, I totally recommend you try uh, some of these foodstuffs. Uh, maybe next time, uh, next Monday, I'll give you a little bit of information on the hazelnuts, because like I said, Piedmont makes the best hazelnuts uh, really in the world. And I'm not saying that because I lived in Italy and I have Italian friends. Most everybody recognizes that. And uh, some other products like, for example, uh, cereal products, and, and others. Anyways, but we'll talk about the Barbarescos of 2017, another different vintage, another difficult vintage, uh, maybe with a bad reputation, but if you look carefully, there are some very wonderful wines, and we're going to taste some really great ones uh, from some very famous producers, and we'll meet those producers from um, Marchese di Grazi and Prunotto and, and the Cortese, lots of very great wines from 2017, Rizzi, uh, so I really invite you to come back next Monday uh, at around seven o'clock uh, Italy time, and uh, uh, it'll be fun. It'll be fun, and we get to talk about some wines that uh, also underrated in a, in a hot year, but that gave some very memorable wines too. So that's it. I thank you really for having listened, and I hope uh, it was enjoyable. I know I enjoyed myself, and... Uh, I hope you uh, got a chance to learn maybe a little something and uh, that um, it'll make you want to go out and try some 18 Berberescos because I think it's, uh, it's really a great vintage for Berberesco. I want to thank everybody at the Enoteca Regionale di Barbaresco. 
because you're the best. Oh, wow, great. Yeah, I need my mother to see that. Hey, can you, can you put that there again so I take a photo? Do me a favor. Because my mother never believes me. Oh, I love you. Thank you very much. Oh, that's it. <laughs> She's always complaining. <laughs> Anyways, thank you, ladies. Ciao. Thank you. Thank thank you. you. It's a lit. Long live Barbaresco, really one of the greatest white wines in the world. And as you can tell, I think some very, very nice people. And that's always the best part about wine. It's the people you meet. Thank you. <laughs> ciao, 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 grazie, ciao. ciao, ciao, ciao. ciao, ciao. Bye. See you next Monday. See you next See Monday. Ciao. Ciao. Ciao, ciao, ciao. ciao.